Good morning. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vicki Bowden. Um, we're so excited to have you all join us for our um, second session of our summer research seminar series. Um, before we begin and I introduce our speaker for today, I did want to share some information with you all. So the format will, um, I'll do my brief introductions, then afterwards we will hear from our speaker and we will close with a Q&A and um, share final announcements as well with speakers. And a couple of reminders, any questions that you may have, please use the Q&A um, feature on Zoom, type in your question, we could answer it live or we'll also, um, you have the option of, we will type in the answer for you too. So for today, um, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Fian Folu uh, Bolagun, who will be speaking on DNA damage repair gone wrong. Mm -hmm. um, to share a bit of Dr. Bolagun's background, he's a medical oncologist specializing in gastrointestinal tumors, including pancreatic, hepatic, and biliary cancers. He completed his undergraduate degree at University of Maryland, Baltimore County, then um, went on to complete his MD, PhD at the University of Chicago with a dissertation on how cells respond to DNA damage. At New York University, he then trained in internal medicine, then went on to complete his hematology oncology fellowship. He joined the G-Oncology team here at Memorial Sloan Kettering, where he continues to pursue his passions of clinical care, research and education. His research spans topics including um, BRCA-associated tumors and hepatopancreatobiliary cancers. Other interests of his include soccer, cooking, music, and adventures with his two sons. We um, are delighted to have Dr. Balagan be our speaker for today. The floor is yours. All right, good afternoon. Nice to meet everyone. Um, so today we'll be talking about DNA damage, especially in the setting of cancer. Uh, one thing I do like to, I do tell a lot of my patients is trying to explain where cancer comes from. Cancer essentially is the accumulation of damage to the DNA. So without DNA damage, there is typically, there's no cancer. So understanding this underlying basic tenet of DNA, what DNA is and what the damage is and how cells respond to it is uh, vital to appreciating um, cancer. So we'll focus on talking about DNA damage in particular how cells respond to it. No disclosures, not financial disclosures to give. Um, in our outline, we'll be talking first talk about what DNA is and then go into stage by stage the different responses that the cells go. At the very end, I'll touch a little bit on telomeres. It'll be a little compact, but I'll just have a brief mention on it. It's, uh, it's hard to talk about DNA and not mention telomeres. So what exactly is DNA? You know, the central dogma is something that we, we, uh, we hear about sometimes, but it's important to understand that to get what DNA is. DNA essentially can serve uh, as the blueprint. And I have our images here. At the bottom, we have this bridge. I would ask who knows what this bridge is, but um, I'm sure everyone can recognize. And if they don't, now they know that this is the Brooklyn Bridge. But in order to get to the Brooklyn Bridge, which is what we need for, you know, for to connect us from Brooklyn to Manhattan, First, we start with a blueprint that so the architect makes. So the blueprints, essentially that's the DNA and it predicts or it tells the cells how to make protein, which is what actually does the job. So the blueprint, the architectural blueprint for the Brooklyn Bridge is required for us to know how to build the bridge, which would do our job for us. So that's the central dogma essentially of DNA, uh, the central dogma, which is DNA, the blueprints, going through an intermediary of the RNA to get to the protein that actually does the job in the end. Now, when you take a little closer look at it, now DNA comes in this double helix form here, which is important to its function and how it actually meant 
transforms its translated information or transmits that information and protects itself. There's a backbone, which in this case are the blue ones, and the colorful ones are the bases. So the bases give each one, that's the information. And they're formed from four different bases, as you see here, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. How those, just like the way we read words, we put letters together to form words, that's how these bases, different bases, can help us go from DNA to uh, interpretation to RNA, and then final translation to protein. It is a basic genetic material that leads to the encoding of our proteins via our RNA. And this information also gets transferred to our offspring. So when a living thing has a offspring, the DNA forms that information that the offspring learns about what cells learn about how to grow and what to do. Unfortunately, DNA is constantly under attack. Spontaneous reactions, which are in, occurring inside our body, can cause damage to DNA. Just metabolism can create species like reactive oxygen species that sometimes you hear about that are toxic to DNA and several chemicals we get exposed to. And in some cases, just the process of the cells, the DNA being replicated, DNA as cells, new cells come about, new blueprints have to be made. That process of replication can also lead to errors that are essentially attacking the DNA and damaging it. And one cell, when you think of how much the cell, how much damage the cells get exposed to, one cell can experience in just one day 100,000 lesions or damages. And that, because of how important the blueprint is, this has to be addressed. So you go under the sun for, say, a little time on the beach, and your skin cells can experience, each cell can experience this many lesions per day. So it is, uh, it is this constant state of attack that the DNA has to experience, even if you shield yourself and you live in a bubble. Now, there are different types of damages that can happen to the DNA, and this is some of the examples here. Remember the backbone? These are the brown ones here, and the colorful ones are our bases that serve essentially as our letters that give us the words. A single strand break breaks the backbone here. A mismatch is when these bases they're supposed to match specifically with each other, but if they pair up with the wrong base, that's what we call a mismatch. And you see here, red typically pairs up with blue. However, we see red pairing up with green here. Green and yellow, red and blue, but here we have a mismatch. A, a base itself can be damaged. We can have break, double strand break, which severs the whole thing. And we can have some bases that cross link the wrong way too. Now, the consequences of DNA damage, obviously, since it's a blueprint, if it does get damaged, whatever proteins are made from that would either not be functioning at all. So we lose the function of those proteins. It's like if we lose our Brooklyn Bridge, then we're not able to get cars across in that direction. Or, and also, they can also lead to this consistent, this loss of protein depending on which protein it is, can cause some diseases and some syndromes that we're familiar with, one of which is premature aging, also called prodroid syndromes, whereby the inability to, your DNA gets damaged and you're not fixing it, would lead cells to get the living thing, to get old faster. Because ideally your cells, they have the damage, they fix it and they keep going. But if they cannot fix their damage, then the cells have to essentially keep being sacrificed or lost, which we'll talk about more. And that leads to aging, premature aging. And of course, the particular evidence does is cancer. Cancer can be one of the big um, consequences of DNA damage. Now, some of the more on a molecular level types of DNA damage that we come across, I say endogenous here because these are the ones that essentially are coming from within our body. So processes that are going on within us can cause these types of damages. The base that we talked about can be changed. Here we see some examples of the different damages. Here it's a base change from a G to U, it's supposed to be a T. This T got changed to a U, so now that's a mispair. The different chemical processes that lead to that, hydrolysis, alkylation, and oxidation, 
was we talked about the single strand break can occur, but double strand break can also occur. On an exogenous level, we get some of these types of damage too, in addition to others. And exogenous are things that come from outside, not within our body that are damaged in our DNA. Free radicals, UV from the sun, you know, that's part of why we need our sunblock when we're outside. Ionizing radiation, chemicals, they can all damage the DNA and lead to different types of DNA damages or damage to the DNA. Now, other than we've talked about the types of DNA damage, and we've also talked about the sources, essentially endogenous and exogenous. Another way we look at DNA damage is when all this damage happens to the DNA, what does that really mean? What, how does that really affect the information that the DNA is trying to send out to the proteins? We look at it as the types of mutations. We have missense mutations, nonsense mutations, frame shift mutations. The missense, essentially, if you look here, focusing on this T, is when one of our the, this, this represents the DNA, the multiple colored ones, and this represents the protein. So the DNA, when like the way you read words come together, they form our protein blocks, building blocks for our protein. Now, a missense mutation is when there's a change in the DNA, this A changes to a T, but that does not translate into a change in the protein. Now, that's good and because the final end product still is the same. And the way this works is to think of it as a word that you change a letter in the word, but it still doesn't change the meaning of the word. So those were called the missense mutations. Silent mutations of note. Oh, sorry, I was describing the silent mutations. So the silent mutations are the ones that there's a change in the DNA, but it does not translate into the protein. The missense mutation is when there is a change that happens and in this case, is a C that turns to an A, and that leads to a change in the protein. So this is proline, but then it becomes thyro uh, tyrosine. So it leads from the C changing to an A, changes what the interpretation is. Uh, let me see, and someone has a raised hand. Not sure how that would work. You could continue and we'll address the question at the end, if that's okay. Okay, okay. sounds good. So the missense is when a change in the DNA leads to a change in the protein. The nonsense mutations essentially when a change in the DNA essentially leads to a truncation of the protein. So proteins, when they're being built, there has to be a stop. When you're building the Brooklyn Bridge, you have to stop somewhere. You can't just build and just continue to go across Brooklyn into the ocean. You have to stop building the bridge somewhere. And that signal to stop, the, it can be prematurely placed. So in this case, this tyrosine changes into a stop codon. And what that does is it tends to truncate your protein, which was supposed to be, say, you know, 100 megabytes, mega, megabytes long, and now it's just... Um, 50 megabytes. The frame shift mutation are insertions and deletions. Now you may notice that these interpretations or these words are coming three in in threes. So three three DNA bases are interpreted into one block. And the frame shift, if you have an insertion, if something gets deleted or inserted, in this case, this T and A get deleted, this your three base gets shifted all the way up. So that's why it's called the frame shifts. And as a result, everything from there on down gets changed. So this veiling stayed the same, but everything else changed down. Now, other than at a base level, another type of way the information changes with DNA damage is essentially a translocation. So where a piece of your chromosome, the chromosome is how your DNA is storage is stored, is packaged, and essentially all this is DNA information packaged nicely and neatly, uh, nice and neatly sort of. And in some cases, you can have a piece just move from one chromosome to another one. Now, when this happens, whereby there's an exchange, that's what we call for the translocation. It's a reciprocal exchange. So we see here that the bottom of this green one 
set chromosome 4 and goes into chromosome 20. And we have this here. And then this chromosome 20 exchanges its own with it. This can generate a new protein because now you have this part of the protein con combined with this or of the DNA combined with this, giving us a whole new entity. This is actually how one of the more commonly known uh, blood protein, blood cancers, CML, has formed a uh, translocation whereby this part of it becomes now under the control of this and that causes a different level of expression of this protein. Now, how do cells respond to this? The key thing, because of how important it is to maintain the fidelity of the information that's passed on to offspring, cells have to come up with a very uh, robust system. And as we mentioned, some cells can experience up to 100,000 damage sessions, damages in one day. So there has to be a very nice and robust system for this. It's important that the information passed on to the offspring is as accurate as possible. And it's necessary to be able to fix the DNA for the cells to live long, especially cells that live long. They don't accumulate too many DNA damages and become uh, a shadow of what they used to be. This involves several coordinated pathways, cell cycle arrest, so we'll touch on these. Cell cycle arrest essentially is, as the cell is growing through its cycle, in its cycle, its life cycle, if there's a damage, the cell would want to pause their cycle, fix the damage before going on to the next step. So it doesn't carry this damage to the next step. Then it repairs the DNA. Apoptosis is cell death. If the cell is unable to repair the damage, then rather than send that, transmit that damaged information to the new offspring cells, it just sacrifices itself. And transcription is the way by which proteins are made that would facilitate these processes. DNA damage response is a very resource intense um, process. Cells dedicate a lot of uh, their energy towards this, and it makes sense because it's such an important process. Now for the cell cycle checkpoint arrest, this is the cell cycle we were talking about, I was talking about. We're, quickly, this is the, the four phases of the cell cycle. G1 is a growth phase. S is a synthesis, synthesis phase where the DNA is duplicated. So this is a process of where a cell is trying to generate its um, offspring, so to speak. It's trying to divide itself into two to create more cells. It goes through a growth phase and then it goes to an S phase, the synthesis phase, essentially where it duplicates, doubles its genetic information. So you make another copy of that blueprint getting ready for your, uh, for dividing. And it goes to another growth phase, G2 phase, preparing a lot here for this mitotic phase whereby the cell actually splits into two. So it has made a photocopy of the DNA here. And when it splits into two cells here, one, each cell gets a new, uh, its own copy. Now G1 check, the checkpoints are places where before you go from one phase to the other, the cell assesses to make sure is everything good to move on. And with the G1, there's a G1 checkpoint before it goes into the S. There's an S checkpoint within the S and the G2M right before it goes into replication. At these points, the cycle can be arrested if the cell notices, oh, come on, there's a, DNA, there's a damage here that we don't want to replicate. So it arrests the cell, arrests the cycle, pause, puts a pause here on the system, gives the cells time to fix the problem before going on to the next phase. So that's what the cell cycle checkpoints do. And that's how the cells, a part of how the cells respond to DNA damage. Next thing, when they pause it, the, what the cells would want to do is repair the DNA, the DNA damage. Uh, more details to come because we'll talk a lot more about it. We'll spend most of our time discussing this. But in case the DNA damage doesn't, the DNA damage repair does not work, the cells can go into apoptosis, which is central controlled cell death. Pretty much, if the cell is unable to repair the damage, it knows that if it passes on this damage to its other cells, it starts to breed or it starts to generate lots of faulty cells. And that would be bad for the organism. So we don't want any of our cells in our body to be passing on faulty blueprint information because next in our body will be overtaken by cells that are not 
that don't know what they're supposed to do and they just um, trouble themselves, so to speak. So the cell would rather sacrifice itself. The system is designed that way. Our body works just such an amazing little, um, amazingly in that way that it, in this setting of catastrophic DNA damage, or if it's unable to repair itself well, it's DNA well, it'll just go in a, into controlled cell death rather than send that information off. Now back to the DNA damage repair, there are several ways uh, which this gets done, and it depends on the type of damage that's been fixed. There is the base, as you remember, the base are the ones that are the words that tell us essentially the letters that we use to read a word, form a word. The base excision repair, the nucleotide excision repair, which is the base plus the backbone, and the mismatch, if you remember, when they pair incorrectly. The double strand break are a big one because it breaks across the whole DNA. So not just a piece of it nicking it, but it cuts the whole thing off. And those tend to cause the most um, trouble. So we'll also talk about the methods at which the cell fixes them. So here's that image again, but here we see a little clearer. Here are some of the DNA damages that we have and some of the causes for them and some of the ways that they're repaired. So when a nucleotide is damaged, the whole nucleotide, or when you have some binding in here, the whole nucleotide, the whole area gets fixed. So the cell essentially cuts off all of this and replaces it. In some cases, the damage is minor, just between the bases or the, between the bases, but the damage is so, the connection between the bases is so significant that this cannot be fixed and the whole thing has to get cut off and replaced. When it's not too big of a damage to the individual bases, then that base can be fixed. And this is when we have our double strand break. Our single strand break is here, but it's still attached. So you just fix the second part. But when this whole thing is detached, it gets a little trickier because the cell has to identify both find this end, find this end and bring them together and still do it without losing information. So this is a very um, deleterious one. And we have it here, different methods by which this occur. So the base excision repair, it replaces the damaged bases. And we see on the right here in imaging, here we talk about here listed to talk about the different processes, chemical processes or reactions that can cause base um, damage that would be fixed by base excision repair. And these steps talk about what I'll just be explaining to you here. Essentially, the bases in this case, the bases are, there's an error in the base, a G and a C. So this C gets re changed into a U. Now the U is the wrong base. So now we have a G and a U and the G only pairs with the C, doesn't pair with the U. In order to fix this, the cell essentially cleaves off this base, gets rid of the U, and cuts a little bit in the backbone and, and, re, and fills it up again. The DNA polymerases are the enzymes that actually work to repair or replicate or make DNA. So different enzymes, different polymerases, and you see here it's listed as polymerase beta, work to, uh, in the different types of DNA repair processes. For the nucleotide excision repair, it's more involved. And we see here, this is a damaged base, but unlike the other one where the damage was, this damage is really an, a mild chemical change to go from a C to a U. If the damage is more involved than that, or if it's a connection that cannot be easily broken, so an inappropriate connection between two bases here, what happens is the, the, uh, for the nucleoside excision repair, the DNA is tightly wound together. The first step is to open it up, and that's where the denaturing happens. And once that happens, it gets cleaved apart. So it doesn't just take out this base, but it just takes out the whole, just a couple of bases to the to each side. And it essentially think of it like you're fi fixing a, a, a porthole or a little hole in the road. You have to sometimes make it a little bigger to get to get a nice clean base. And the good thing is because these 
pair together, you already know what pairs with this. So you know if this is a G, this should be a C. So to fix this, all the cell has to do is read this other partner because it knows what pairs with each individual base and it just fills it in. When it fills it in, it seals it up and that's it. Nucleus excision repair has fixed this your DNA. But as you can see, it's also more involved than the initial just change in the base. Some of the ones that we hear more with cancer mismatch repair occur. This is a damage that occurs during, very commonly during replication, whereby they're not matched appropriately. So whereby they're the mismatch repair, whereby it fixes mismatches of um, uh, bases or DNAs that don't match appropriately. This is commonly heard in some kind of cancers where there's a high risk of this occurring because the cells, the cancer cells have lost the ability to perform mismatch repair. So they start to have mutations that are associated with mismatch repair because the cell cannot repair those anymore. So they just seem to accumulate. But these are also bases, mismatch bases, and the cell has a specific system, the mismatch repair system that addresses it. Uh, the loss of this system is associated, can also be called MSI, which stands for microsatellite instability, and is associated with high cancer risk and also can even predict how our treatment occurs. Now, one of the big ones, as I had mentioned, is the deleterious um, double strand break. The big problem with it is both strands get cleaved. So when one strand gets cleaved or the damage is on one slant, strand, you can use the other strand as a template to fix this one. As we saw here, the damage is on this upper strand. Even when you cleave that out, you still have this as a template to fix this. In double strand breaks, you don't have that template anymore. You just have a cut and the cell has to figure out how to fix this together. It's the most, it causes a lot of damage. It, when it's a, a significant amount can lead to cell death and you can lose significant information because whatever was damaged here, the cell may not realize that some stuff was damaged and just clean, put this back together. And as a result, you lose whatever was in here before. And um, there are multiple repair pathways that the cell uses to fix this from homologous recombination, which is very accurate to NHEJ. We'll touch on these non-homologous end joining, which is not as accurate, but is very efficient. Um, the repair process itself can cause for the damage. And I'll highlight that when we talk about the non-homologous end joining. We see here just an overall view. It, when the double strand break occurs, there are multiple processes in which it can be fixed. Homologous combination, end joining, non-homologous end joining, alternate end joining. This is so significant that the cell does have multiple mechanisms by which to repair it. For homologous recombination, this is very focused on efficient on accuracy. So the, here we have, and it's relatively error-free. Here we have two sister chromatids. If you remember in our S phase of the cell cycle, the DNA has already duplicated itself because it's preparing to have two cells and split it apart. Now, the advantage of that is by duplicating itself, now it has the original DNA and it has a duplicate copy. So if in that S phase, if there's a double strand break damage that occurs, even though you don't have a template because both of them are breaking, you do have a photocopy of this DNA. So the cell can take advantage of the presence of that photocopy to make itself to fix the original DNA. And we see here, it processed the ends and it essentially goes into copy, the, make a copy of the photocopy. So when it's done, the original one, there's a mix in both of them, the information, but this information, the red one, was gotten from, that's now in the blue one, was initially a copy of the blue one. So it should be the same thing. But this, as you can imagine, because it needs a photocopy of the original DNA, can only occur in the S phase. There are certain mutations that proteins that are, work here, and if they're lost, they're associated with cancers, and we actually do take advantage of that 
to in cancer cells that have lost them to treat them. One of the more commonly heard ones is the BRCA mutation. BRCA is involved in this repair process. And as a result, if we, if we realize that our, the cancer has lost its BRCA protein, we can take advantage of that in the treatments that we give because we know the normal cells actually still have their BRCA intact or their embryonic BRCA intact. The other process, the other main process of fixing the double strand breaks is, of fixing the double strand break is the non-homologous end joining. And in this case, efficiency is much faster, more important than accuracy. First, this does not require a template strand. Excuse me, doesn't require a template strand. So it's able to, occur in all phases of the cell cycle, not just the S phase. It is fast, the homologous end joining. This is not a, this is not a fast process. It takes uh, in multiple steps and sometimes the cell just needs to keep going. And um, so no template is required, making sure it works everywhere. Blunt ends, it doesn't have to process these ends, just takes the ends as they are and just brings them together and seals it. But because of that, not having any template and just sealing those ends without caring for what was inside or what was lost before, it is error prone and can generate errors. So when we talk about the repair process, actually being able to cause errors, this is one of the key examples we use. So a simple summary of how the double strand break works is double strand break occurs, it can occur via Double strand break occurs, the repair can be via homologous recombination or non-homologous end joining. This gets a copy, uses the photocopy, the duplicate as a template. So with that template, it knows what needs to go here and fills it in accurately. In non-homologous end joining, there's no template. So it just essentially cleans up the edges and sticks them back together. So this occurs quickly, this takes a while, but this is more accurate. And they all have, which is beyond the scope of this lecture, they have their advantages and disadvantages. This is also, the efficiency is definitely key for cell cycle growth, but even the error in it can be, can be of an advantage too. Some of the other costs of DNA damage repair is that not all damage gets repaired. Sometimes the cell tries and when you have a, possibly 100,000 lesions in a day in one cell, it, mix, it misses some of them or it doesn't fix them appropriately. And um, ideally this would lead to apoptosis, the cell death. And in some cases, the cell just kind of settles in with the damage. They say, okay, we have this damage that's hard to fix. We're going to use a repair mechanism that just kind of patches it over. Also, when damage occurs, there could be some repair scars. Like in the example of the non-homogous end joining, when this is just processed and just stuck back together, the scars that you get from that could lead to information loss and could also lead to some changes in the gene in the DNA structure overall that leads to instability of it. And um, damage overall, the DNA damage itself and possibly the repair, which can cause uh, inaccurate information, contribute to oncogenesis, which is the generation of cancer, the growth, the development of cancer. Now, as I had started, um, going back to how I had um, started a conversation, in terms of DNA damage and cancer. Cancer oncogenesis, the development of cancer, is a result of the accumulation of mutations. Your cells undergo so many mutations, but they try to fix it. And in some cases, they don't fix them. And those cells get uh, go under, undergo apoptosis. But in other cases, they don't fix them and the cells manage to bypass apoptosis and they start to accumulate mutations and they become less like normal cells. And some of these mutations may occur, most of them won't occur in, can in proteins that lead to cancer, but every now and then it could happen whereby the mutations lead to cancer. Some of the 
things that are associated with cancer, mutations are mutations that promote growth and survival. If those mutations are turned in such that are turned on from the from the if those proteins are turned in from the mutation such that they're always on, then all the cell wants to do is grow and survive, grow and survive, nothing else. Doesn't want to pause, doesn't want to contribute to this to the body, the function of the organism. And that essentially is the definition of cancer. Cancer cells are just about growth and not really doing anything else. They just want to survive and they essentially take over the body or the portions where they are. There are also some proteins that the body has to prevent these tumors from happening, to prevent cancers from happening. Mutations that occur in those, like TP53 and RB1, can lead to cancer because these are breaks that are supposed to pause the, be on the lookout. And if a cell or a process appears to be heading towards formation of a tumor, these proteins will keep it in check. But now if they've been lost due to mutation that disrupts them, it gives the cells more likelihood to become tumors. Cancer cells are also tend to be defective in genome maintenance. So because they're trying to grow and focus more on growth, they tend to focus on the to focus less on the processes that keep them in check. So that keep the cell cycle progression from going forward. The cancer cells think, well, we don't need that. We just want to grow. So they put that aside. And things that also control their replication to make sure that not, cells are not replicating too fast or to make sure that everything is ready for re replication. The cells are just thinking, all we care about is our growth. We don't care about anything else with the organism. So. As a result of that, the cancer cells tend to not have a good way of maintaining their genome since they traded all that in for the ability to just grow quickly. One thing that this does, however, is it helps them evolve quickly because they have so many mutations that keep, it, that keep coming up. While you may find a mutation and a target in a cancer that you can use for treating the cancer, as the cancer accumulates mutations easily, it stops being responsive. It can stop being responsive to that treatment. So that loss of genomic maintenance of uh, keeping its genome well cared for can actually be an advantage to the cancer cells. So that's why they seem to evolutionarily maintain that. Now, things that we do, some of the examples in which we're able to target the DNA damage in the treatment of cancer, it's a gift and a curse. So this defective genome maintenance, as I just described how it favors them in terms of being able to avoid and evade treatments because they change so frequently. They also have, they don't have a backup repair mechanism because they've lost that ability. And one of those is in the BRCA mutation. And this is an, an example of how it would work in a normal cell. So in the normal cells, they have their BRCA that's functional. When they get exposed to DNA damage, oxidative DNA damage, they get single strand breaks, about 10,000 per cell per day from these. The cells can get fixed by PARP. PARP is what is one of the proteins that work in the single strand uh, repair pathway, which is another uh, pathway way of repairing uh, these single strand breaks you see. So you have a single strand break, the single strand break pathway that fixes it can fix it. If this is not fixing it well, or this is feeling overwhelmed, the double strand break pathway can also fix some of these cells. And some of these damages can also lead, become double strand breaks and get fixed by this pathway. So there are two ways, there are back, there's a primary pathway and a backup pathway. Now in cancer cells and tumor cells, they've lost their BRCA. They're, they're BRCA mutated, they're BRCA deficient. This mutations that they accumulate help them grow quickly, help them become cancerous cells, tumor cells. So they don't mind losing it because the cancer cells are thinking, well, sort of, the advantage for them is they can still repair it through the single strand pathway if they have a damage. They have a damage that they don't want to keep going. Even though this pathway is gone, they still have this pathway. So they're, they're still okay. Now, keeping that in mind, what we're able to do is this is this top here is the same, is the same graph picture we just show, I just showed you, but comparing it to 
when we actually add our medication to it. The tumor cells to the right, the normal cells to the left. Same situation with the oxidative DNA damage, single strand break, repaired by a single strand pathway or double strand. Now, when you add a medication that inhibits PARP, so you turn off the single strand repair pathway, repair is inhibited by PARP, normal cells still have this double strand break pathway repair as a backup. So they're, they'll be fine, they'll survive from that. But the tumor cells, remember, gave up this pathway, double strand break pathway, in order for them to grow and become tumorous. And they've been depending on this. So if we knock out this pathway that they depend on, now they don't have a backup to go to and they die. These are the kind of things that we try to take advantage of in terms of targeting therapy. So when we talk of targeted therapy, it's about identifying things in the tumor that are absent in the normal cells. And if we're able to target those in the tumors, we're able to lead to death of the tumor cells, the cancer cells, but without affecting significantly the normal cells. So I think um, for the sake of time, I will skip on the telomeres. That was more of if we had time, we'll talk about it. But for the sake of time, I'll skip on that for now. Um, the key thing to note is the telomeres are the end of the DNA. And since the DNA is not circular, it's at the very end of the chromosome. The cell has ways to protect this end such that it's not always interpreted when the, as, a, as a DNA damage. Because if the cell sees naked ends that are just double strand end, break ends, it may think that it's a double strand break and try to repair it. But telomere is, a, is the ability of the cell to actually have structures and systems to protect that end. But um, we won't go into telomeres because uh, for the sake of time. So we'll stop here and um, hopefully we've been able to talk or um, touch a bit more about, give an introduction to what DNA damage is and how cells respond to it and how this can lead to cancer and mechanisms by which we can take advantage of it in treatments. So we can uh, address questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Balagun. Um, we have several questions. So we'll start with Natalie Sedillo asks, can having too many chromosomes be a problem? Yes, having too many chromosomes can be a problem. The human being, human, different species of different animals have a sp specific number of chromosomes. Uh, in humans, it's 23 pairs. And if you have too many chromosomes, you essentially have multiple pieces of the same information. And that could be a, uh, an overwhelming amount. If your body needs just maybe two, a certain amount, maybe 100 pieces of, of protein, BRCA protein, but you have two duplicate chromosomes of that, now you have 200 pieces that's more than your body needs. And the function that was supposed to be done essentially gets doubled and usually leads to um, trouble. Some of the cancers can develop in that way and we call them duplication. So if a part that has a protein that directs uh, replication and cell, cell growth, if you double that, then that cell will now favor being doing more replication and growth and not because it has a lot of extra resources that's telling it to grow, grow, grow. So yes, the simple answer is yes. Okay, great. Thank you. The next question comes from Tony. They ask, why would a cancer cell want to use a repair mechanism like PARP? It, in case of where there's a single strand break, and that's a good question too, where there's a single strand break, the cells know that Cells in general, they need to fix their damage because the DNA damage, if it's too much, will lead to cell death. The tumor cells, the cancer cells, wants to keep growing. So if it has a single strand break or any damage, it wants to fix it. But it, it would lean on its, for example, with the PARP, it would lean on its um, single, in cancers that have lost their BRCA protein, it would lean on its PARP because it doesn't have its backup anymore. So in order to fix that break so that the cell can still keep leaving, 
it would fix it through the PARP pathway, the single strand break pathway. Great, thanks. The next question is from Fabriciana. They ask, do you believe we can lengthen our telomeres through aggressive nutritional excellence in order to repair cancer promoting DNA damage? No, so the telomere lengthening is, it's a, it's a very interesting topic, but essentially our telomeres getting shorter is by design because you don't want our cells to live forever. If they live for two, if they live forever, they essentially would have a higher chance of accumulating mutations. And as they get older, they just need to be refreshed and replaced by new ones. So it's actually a normal part of a normal process in life. We don't have ways in which we're able to inc lengthen our telomeres yet, uh, not by nutrition or not by any medications or anything that we know of. But ideally, we don't want to do that much. Uh, this is a graph I was going to show, which essentially telomere length on the Y and number of cell divisions. As cells divide more and more, the telomere length gets shorter. So you see normal cells, telomere length gets shorter. It goes in this direction. And then it gets to a point where it gets old and it just dies because of how short the telomere is. That plays a role in that. And you want that because you want new cells to take up the place of old cells. You don't want all your cells to accumulate. Cancer cells ex escape this because they figure out how to lengthen their telomeres so they don't get to that point of it getting short to where they die. So actually it's not a good thing for, for our telomeres to keep getting longer. We, there are a lot, there's a lot of research going into that and aging to see if we can reverse the aging process by keeping our telomeres long but obviously we have to be careful or well, there's a lot of thinking of being balanced between not turning your cells into immortal cancer cells if you're trying to lengthen them. Great, thank you. And our next question is from Dominique. They ask, at the molecular level, do you think that the effects of historic public health disparities could potentially cause harmful mutations that can increase one's susceptibility to cancer specifically breast and lung cancer? So that's a very good question. I think um, from what we know, a lot of the environment plays a big part. So not everything is genetic or inherited. So you remember we talked about both the exogenous and the endogenous processes. So some of the, some, some of the disparities and uh, inequities that we see can increase the effect of exogenous damage on our DNA. So say, for example, in certain parts of, say, New York, even in New York, uh, the certain parts of the city that are more, where the air is more populated or there are things in the environment that decrease, that increase our risk to exposures, and all, even with the food or the diet that we eat. So in places that are typically known as food deserts, and we have certain amounts of certain types of food, we know that these some kinds of foods increase the risk of um, um, cancer or chemicals that may be in them. So those are things that would act via the environment to increase exposure to DNA damaging agents. So it can occur in that regard, but they don't get inherited. It's a function of the environment. Okay, great. Thank you. The next question is from Siddharth. They ask if there's a specificity about whether DNA gets damaged in its condensed chromosomal state or decondensed state? And the follow-up to that is, can DNA get damaged in both states? It can get damaged in both states. It gets more damage in its uncondensed state. And that's a, that's a good question because the condensed phase, essentially, it does keep it because its site keeps it protected from some of the um, damaging agents. But it's still, there's still processes going on that can lead to damage in its condensed states. And it's in, in its uncondensed states, the DNA tends to be more active. So if it's going to be going through replication, it's in its uncondensed phase. So other than the, just the idea of being condensed versus uncondensed, the uncondensed phase also has more activity that can increase the risk of DNA damage. So we get, we see much more damage in that um, state. 
Okay, great. That's all the questions we can take um, for today's session. Thank you again, Dr. Balogun, for today's um, seminar. We greatly appreciate um, all that you shared. And is there any contact information? Perfect. Um, so you see um, Dr. Balogun's email here on the slide. So if there's any questions that you had that weren't addressed here, um, please email him directly. We'll also share with our attendees um, a follow-up survey that we ask that you all um, complete with any questions or concerns you have regarding our seminar series. Thank you again, Dr. Balogun, for your time, and thank you to all of our, our, of our participants for joining us this afternoon. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. You're welcome. My pleasure, and hopefully it was an informative session, um, and um, the questions were very, very, very good and challenging. I appreciated them. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank again. you. Bye.